Hola, comadres. Welcome to another episode of Comadre on the Podcast. I'm your host, Marcy, and we have an amazing guest today, Eori. I will let her introduce herself. Who are you? Who am I or what am I? Who are you? Uh, we're going to start with who am I. Uh, my name is uh, Eurydice Roman. I Let's see. I'm a City College uh, alum. I graduated back in 2007. And what I'm currently doing now, I'm working at a work art museum as pension and benefits and medical stuff. So that's the perk of being there. Um, also, I do have a show called The Scissor Spotlight, currently on Bronxnet and Eminem, which is on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And my show is usually on Tuesdays between 5 and 6 p.m. Shameless plug. Shameless plug. And um, let's see, what else? Oh, um, I'm planning a fundraiser called Latino Success on Autism. And let's see. Get off, get off. Oh, I do short films. I did a documentary called The Autism Cycle, which was about parent, provider, and organization. It was very um, informational, mixed in with personal. I tried not to, like, really get too close to, like, um, a lot of people were like, oh, why don't you talk about more controversial things? I'm like, no. Because in the Latino, the especially the black and brown communities, we don't, we don't use science behind a lot of things. It's always something personal to us. And I'm an autism mom. My son's 12 years old. And um, he was diagnosed when he was 18 months old. And uh, let me tell you, it, the work never stops. I think, as you know, it's never a day off. <laughs> Maybe 30 minutes, intervals. You can get to yourself and then wait. Oh my gosh. Um, but I thank you so much for sending this um, podcast, Comadre. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so I met, I usually tell my um, followers how I met my guests. So um, Eudi and I connected, I call her Eudi, guys, because in Spanish, her name is Eudi Dice. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I call her Eudi. Um, so I met Eudi through um, Instagram. We connected via Rick, one of our mutual friends. Um, he connected, he sent me actually a clip from one of her short films uh, about autism. So, um, you know, after that, we started following each other and um, we're just like each other's biggest fans. Like we're constantly um, reaching out and interacting online. Um, I'm actually going to be attending the comedy show that's going to be um going down on april 9th here in new york city yeah so today's topic is basically you know i like to highlight different autism moms um and the reason why is because i like to give flowers to um these hardworking mothers and um you know it's good to share our stories so that other people don't feel alone and to and continue to create that sense of community um within the comadres and also other people that are listening so you told us your child's diagnosis. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. When did you notice that your son was different? Oh, boy, let's see. Um, I will tell you, it was interesting. Um, one day, really quickly, I know time is limited. Um, <laughs> it was so cute. He was in one of those little chairs that, that like, um, when you turn it on, they vibrate, so the kid's like, but it calms them. All of a sudden, um, mm -hmm. one day I didn't turn on that chair, and he was just there. I was like, okay, he's just looking. He's not saying anything. And at that point, he was about four or five months, and he hadn't like he didn't babble. He didn't like make eye contact a lot. He was always like looking everywhere and things like that. So I was like, okay. This is the progression of it. As he got a little older, like, you know, nearing one, one and a half years old, he started doing the, the anytime you look at a circular object, he wouldn't make eye contact with it. He'd look at it from the side like this. He would be stacking cans. And then um, I would tell him, no, don't stack the cans. It's going to fall on you. He's like, stacking cans. Um, and he was stuck on four words. And then my mother was like, listen, there is something definitely wrong. And I was like, okay. You know, sometimes moms, you know, moms know more than, you know, new moms. And I decided mm -hmm. to call early intervention. And then they sent in a 
psychologist, physical therapist, speech therapist, and soci um, social worker. And then they boiled it down to the following. They're like, okay. The psychologist was like, okay, he has two things going on. I said, okay, but what is it? Um, he has autism, but also he has ADHD going on. I said, okay. All right, so what do you suggest I do? And I was like, what I did, speech therapy, occupational, and counseling, because it looks like he gets frustrated and annoyed and so far so forth. And uh, yeah, we started that journey. I think the worst thing I heard during early intervention that kind of stuck with me is that, um, what's this thing called? Um, I don't know if this has happened to you, but um, the one word the, so the social worker used is like, oh, he's a user. I said, he's a user. User, what do you mean user? Exactly. I said, uh, elaborate, please, because this is uh, sounding really condescending and really debasing, you know, what the child, this child right here. And I don't appreciate the, what you're implying. She's like, no, no, no. His interactions are very short. Like, if he needs something from you, that's when he interacts with you. But and there's other ways to refer to that, not like saying that he's a user. Exactly. I said, um... You could have used something else contextually, or you could have used some other vocabulary to describe his behavior. So it's just um, when his needs are met, he does, he feels that's the end of the interaction. Tell me like that, but he's a user. Like, yeah, I don't like you, that. You realize we're in Harlem, right? Like, I, I don't need to tell your your special Caucasian self where we are. You know, they are afuera. that. <laughs> just in case. I just look at her like, okay. No, right. I can't. Um, and, um yeah, that was that that really struck a nerve. And um after that, um I just started the services. We had them come to the house. Uh we had a speech therapist and occupational therapist come to the house at least what, two, three times a week before we started Head Start. And um Head Start was fun because um he was in daycare. So he was the the biggest one out of all the kids. So he was ten months old. Then there was a what a six month old, then a three, then a one. So he it was a small daycare. There's barely four kids. And I'm like, okay, he's fine. So when he started preschool, they put him in a class of twelve. I was like, oh dear God. And then everybody had different um, variations. And then it was like every other week. He would come home exhibiting a behavior from the other kids because he was mimicking what he saw. And I was just like, ah. <laughs> the screaming, uh-uh, I'm out. I said, you only scream if you're in imminent danger. Not if you're in the house and I'm not giving you what you want. That's not helping me. That's not helping you. Yeah. So, um, so he was 10 months when he started that program, the socialization program? Yes, when he was in regular daycare, yes. Um, I was very fortunate that I was able to stay with him until he was about 10 months old at home. And mm, then um, okay. I was, what helped me out is that um, I had to go on welfare. I'm not proud of it um, because at that point I hadn't worked a lot. Cool. Of so when did he, when did he start the um, early intervention? 18 months. Okay. So, 18 months. Um, after he was in daycare, then I decided at 18 months for him to actually start the early intervention program. And that's when he got the diagnosis and we went from there. Um, it was interesting because at the time his father is, was, is and still isn't supportive enough to recognize. And unfortunately, the Dominican community, there's still a lot of ignorance towards um, you know, what autism is. And see, this is mm -hmm. what kind of upsets me. Like, um, when people don't understand the condition and the diagnosis, as much as as much as you try to help them out, try to lead them into it always boils down, I put those like some intelligence. I to sabe que yo saben hacer muchas cosas. I'm just trying to do like this, like, okay. 
Yes, I, I, I never said my child was stupid. <laughs> it's just the way mm -hmm. he learns and process is completely different. And it, it was just, yeah, you know, it was interesting. And uh, it was heartbreaking because I believe a lot of the disconnect came from family and from people that I was lifelong friends with when the diagnosis came up because a lot of people were, they, tr they treat me like fragile glass. You know what I mean? And, yeah, um, I understand that. And there's been times that I've gotten into it with people that I, I don't know from Adam. And it's just like, it's hard. It never gets easy. But um, it doesn't mean I'm going to stop fighting. It doesn't. Not at all. I can't stop being an advocate just because it's uncomfortable and I don't appreciate lights in my face. So, yeah. And um, it's been rough. I, I wish I could tell you it's been easy. But as you know, it, it's not. Because there's times that you don't know what the triggers are. No matter how the years transgress, the triggers change. Like for six months, I might not like bright lights in my face. Or for six months, I don't like the sound of hand dryers, especially if they're mm. loud. Or I don't like the sound of the fridge right now humming my face. <laughs> like it's going to run away. So every, I feel like every six months, I, I have a leeway. Oh, and his delay in terms of um, his autism, um, well, his autism is six months. So Okay, so that's, that's not too bad. No, thank gosh. Um, I've met people that have had like a year or two. Or for example, they're phys physiologically one age, but they function at another. Like uh, one person that I met, her daughter just turned nine, but she functions at, at a five-year-old like understanding level of everything which is tough so i i looked out that ellis is physiologically 12 mm -hmm. but he's really 11 and a half and you know the milestones oh I, ooh, child. Mm -hmm. pediatrician's office sometimes it feels like they put all these pressures on you of you're supposed to be this, and you're supposed to be this, yet, 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 and you just look at them like, okay, thank you. So your child's supposed to be doing this. Your child's supposed to be doing that. There's a lot of supposed to be doing. How about, I'm happy he woke up today. How about that? He did his own zipper. He tied his own shoe. He put on his clothes. How about that? Give me that as a victory. That he brushed his own teeth that I didn't have to go like, Okay, now your teeth are clean. Yeah. yeah. There's definitely like a deficit-based approach a lot of the time when we talk about our kids with special needs. And um, it's a little disheartening, especially when you're, it's the first time that you're hearing a diagnosis and you're hearing all these things like, oh, you can't, your child cannot do this, your child cannot do that. I get it. You have to compare them to their typical neurotypical peers. But, um you know, it's not just about the things that they cannot do. Like, you have to focus also on the things that they are good at and, you know, things that they're exceptional at, too. Because the thing is, like, all right, he might not be able to tie his shoes, but he can audio and video record um, his own shows and post them on YouTube. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's, there's like, um, there, there has to be a change in the way that we refer to our children in, in, in a way to empower them and empower parents as well. Because the problem is that a lot of the moms get very discouraged when they see um, or they hear somebody comparing their child who is special and who has all the connections, right? But their brain is just wired differently. Of course. Right? Their brain is just wired differently. So it affects those moms, especially I remember... Like you kind of, you know, at the beginning when, when I first got the diagnosis, it was kind of like really, I, I, I got honestly depressed, you know, because it was like, you know, I'm in this room, these people are telling me everything my child cannot do. And then, you know, the fear of the future, you know, you don't know what's going to happen or what their future is going to be like because of all these things that you're being told that they cannot do, you know, so um, 
it's a lot. Yeah. Um, I think, um, I'm going to see. When I did hear the diagnosis, I'm not going to lie, I had to Google it. I didn't know what it was. Um, me, myself, after so many years of dealing with ADHD, and then there's always new things that come up with ADHD. And uh, thanks to a, a couple of things on YouTube now, I mean, on Instagram, one is called uh, ADH Society. And um, I think they're great. And it's nice that there is something like that created for people. And it does help me because there are some things that I'm just like, really? And um, yeah, what, like for example, when I got my diagnosis as a child, I didn't know what it was. I said, you think, okay, I'm what? Oh, that you have um, attention deficit hyper disorder. Me? Hyper? Have you met me? Like, do I look like I'm hyper to you? <laughs> Sassy, maybe. <laughs> think I might know a little too much? Ah, eh, sometimes. Not, not not the right things that you think I should be knowing. Though. But I do know. Because I'd be watching. <laughs> and, um, yeah. It's, um, it's tough. And uh, I, I try not to get depressed. I was for a bit. And uh, ever so often, it kind of smacks you over the head like bang. And it's not so much them. It's always the constant worry of, okay, well, that's right. In our case, our, our sons, will he be able to do this? Like, can I really leave him by himself to do this? Will he learn how to, hey, can, it, can I send you with this list of groceries where you know where in the you know, will you go shopping? Will you bring back at least the items on the list? If I take you to the laundromat, will you at least, you know, know where to put the detergent, the fabric softener, and have the patience to sit there and wait for the machine to finish? And half the time my answer is no. <laughs> Not right now. As it gets older, maybe we'll grow a little bit more patience. Be sacrificed. One of one of my key phrases is um, when they ask me about what my son is able or not able to do. Um, I always say not yet, right? Oh yeah. Because we don't want to we don't want to rule it out as something that is not going to happen. No. Um, so tell me, when you first got the diagnosis, did you have support from your family or friends or otherwise at the beginning? I know you were saying a little bit, mm -hmm. kind of, mm -hmm. some people changed. Or we're yeah. treating you differently after the diagnosis. So can you like uh, um, elaborate a little bit more on that? Uh, my son's godmother is a social worker, so she was very supportive. Uh, my mom, 100% supportive. And of course, 100%. Te lo dije, yo sabía que había algo. I'm like, okay, all right. There's something. Okay. All, all right, proud autism grandma. I got you. I got you, abuela. Um, so there was that, um, a lot of my older friends, like some, some of them from grammar school, yeah, I've had to like tell them, listen, he, you know, he's really polite, very honest. So just try to, you know, don't treat him like he's a, like, he won't understand you, but don't treat him like he's like. Like, you're scared of him either. So he will pick up on it, and he will tell you, like, dude, what's wrong with you? Like, what's up? But, um, yeah, I think um, he helped me filter out a lot of people that I just didn't need. Honestly. He helped me filter out a lot of people I didn't need. And, um, yeah, the diagnosis was something that I just tried to deal with as time progresses. And, um... I'm not going to say, you know, like you, like you, you don't limit, you don't put like certain expectations on him. I, it, see, oh, I, I, here's an here's a interesting point. For me, I've gotten the question, oh, what do you want your son to be when he's older? Really, out of everything you could potentially ask me, that's what you want to ask me? No, no hay ningún otro tema que te importa. 
uh -huh. que, que venga eso. No, pero es una mala pregunta, no te ofendas. You know, it's just a question, no te ofendas, don't get all. But no. The thing is, you're asking me to put a barrier or a hindrance on him. I like him to surprise me. Listen, I, I've told him a hundred times, I said, you can be whatever you like to be as long as it's within your reach and you're passionate enough that you want to do what you want to do. And definitely don't, don't get yourself hurt and don't land up in, in financial problems. <laughs> and on top of that, I would definitely avoid you. Por favor, please. Like, I've worked too hard to stay, you know, with my head above water. I'm sorry. I don't want you to sink. So, it's still okay. Um, I don't know. I, I was depressed for a little bit. I think it manifested in me not uh, indulging in self-care and really, like, worrying more about him than myself at times. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, so you felt that, you felt like you you couldn't you felt guilty in taking time for yourself? Is that like whenever he was in daycare and I was like, oh my god, what do I do? Because I wasn't working steady, I was only working part time. I was like, oh my god, can I do I go? Oh my god, it's a Monday. What do I do? What do I do? <laughs> like I felt myself so lost. Because sometimes, um, you know, for example. I was working part time. Had I been working full time, I definitely wouldn't have had time for that question. I would just have been like, okay, I'm going to go to the deli, pick up a sandwich, and sit on the park bench. Okay, I got two hours, and then he comes back, and then bada bing, I'm good. <laughs> but now, when I was working part time, it was just like, oh my God, what do I do? Do I go to a movie? A movie? Um, do I go to my diary? Do I go to my meals? Oh no, me falta leche. Oh no, me falta ropa. Oh no, I have to buy pampers. Where are they on sale? So it, it just, mm, not guilty. It was just like, uh, I used to keep myself busy. So when I'm not busy, I'm just kind of like, anxiety's creeping in there. And then I'm all like, when I have too much quiet time or too much downtime, it's like, yeah, what do I do? So, mm. you know. So tell me more about Ellis. Like, who is he? What makes him sparkle? Like, what kind of things is he into? What kind um, of kid is he? Let's see. Well, uh, how do I put this? Like, somebody told me to describe. He's a boy's boy. I said, what do you mean he's a boy's boy? No, he's a rough and tumble boy. I said, rough and tumble? No, that he's like, he's into everything that has a wheel and moves. He's into... Motorcycles, he's into cars, he's into airplanes, he's into especially trains. Trains is his thing. I can't even tell you how many times I've been to the transit museum. And I thank God that I work at a museum and I get free admission to go to the transit museum or casino. And sometimes even just getting off the one train, he'll make me literally go, I want to see the train leave. We just got off the train. We have to be safe. And then I have to break down. I was like, okay, fine. Está bien, we'll watch the one train. Buy one train, stay away from the yellow. Buy one train, stay away from the yellow. <laughs> Bye. So there's that. Um, he's very polite. Because um, I'm polite. So I, I guess it's so an heredado. Uh, very dynamic. Uh, very lovable. A lot of people go, oh, he's such a nice kid. He's really lovable. No malicioso, he's not malicious. Um, and the thing is, he's a really good mimic. That's why I'm, I'm doing a short film this summer. Um, it's called Graduation Day. It's going to be fun. So I'm like, I'm going to put your echoelia, which is the repetition of constant words and phrases, to good use. Let me see if I could get a good scene out of you and you do the acting. Mama, like, give me something. And uh, yeah, I think that's where he got that from. And uh, now that I'm doing the television show, um, at least once a month, and I interview and I do interviews, he's gotten used to the fact that, oh, are we going to be on TV? Like, you heard him. Are we going to be on TV? Oh, are, am I going to be in your movie? Or <laughs> before he wasn't like that at all. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. He's super once. cute. He well, was like, before we started recording, Comandres, he, he was in the background, and he was like, oh, are we going to be on M&N? 
And and um, Eudi told him no, but um, that she was going to be interviewed. He was like, oh, okay. And then he like walked away, which is cool because he understands, you know? No, I, I, love, I love that. I involve him so much sometimes that uh, like any guest that I interview for my show, either on Eminem, uh, for Eminem and Brosnan, he'll say hi to the person. And um, I have a documentary um, in the works. So right now I'm down to a rough cut version. I'm trying for 90 minutes. So far I've got 75. I interviewed six different families in six different states, all via Zoom. So Maryland, Georgia, New Jersey, California, Florida, and two people here in New York. And I spoke to um, Ayanna Davis, uh, Phenomenally Autistic, and she is the lead person for New York. She was on my show. She's actually, yeah. She's amazing. She's a headliner for this season, which I'm so excited about. Um, Yeah, so I'm excited about the film, but we're going to get more into that in a little bit. I wanted to ask you a little bit more serious question, though. Um, What are some of your fears and reservations as a parent of a child who will young, who will, who will one day be a young man with autism? Uh, I definitely should not have watched the show Love, um, what's this thing called? But Love on the show, Spectrum? Yeah, Love on the Spectrum. I shouldn't have watched that show because that was depressing. And that's the hardcore reality. So um, to those of you who have not watched Love on the Spectrum, I suggest you do. Um, see, I have a few fears. Um, being that we're Latinos, we're looked down upon. And sometimes it's hard to reconcile that in the society. And then the Latino with a neurological condition. So that's kind of like another rock. Or like if you had to do a mountain of rocks, it's like the rocks are just stacking on top of you. And um, my fear is, is that work-wise, it'll be hard for him to find something and also uh, life and work balance. Because when he's passionate about something, he will go full throttle into it, which is good for the work that's required. But then to disconnect from it because he finds such a safe space in what he does is very difficult. So my fear is him trying to find work and life balance and also try to deal with things once they fall apart. Like once things fall apart. Yeah, that's a big one for a lot of my students too. He doesn't know what to do. It's like computer down, system crash. And you just look at them like, really? Yeah, teaching him flexibility is going to be a big thing. But he's young enough that you can work on that, you know, with him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so. And, um, also, mm-hmm. he's a social, social-wise, super friendly person. The thing is, it's just um, other people. With his conversations, I have to tell him, like, uh, eye contact and uh have you asked the person their name? Have you asked them if they have an interest in wanting to talk to you instead of just... Mm-hmm. And he's like, uh, no. So teaching him like appropriate initiation of conversations? Yes. Social okay. cues. Because sometimes social cues will get him in trouble. Yeah. So, Once I saw Love on the Spectrum, I kind of got interested in having like that, that coach to teach them social interactions you know like a one-on-one kind of thing um because that 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 seems like latina or you know a person of color be like okay sis okay venga mama Mm -hmm. (laughs) like do all the coursework that you have to do and specialize in this so Mm -hmm. we're on the search for that i'm not volunteering for that i got it (laughs) (laughs) i can't um all right so that's good thank you so much for that so let's switch gears a little. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, let me see you wanted to add something else? Yeah, okay, I want to add something else. Um, and also that I am, um, I, I want him to learn a little bit, but I have to work with him towards it. When someone um, is like, for example, if they have select mutism or they're hard of hearing or they're deaf or they're, um, or they're nonverbal. And, uh, he has a friend that he graduated with. His name is Sebastian. And um, shout out to Sebastian. Thank you for coming to the birthday party. 
and um, he doesn't speak, but oh my gosh, he would follow Ellis everywhere. And, you know, he would make, and, and I had to tell Ellis, I said, listen, uh, Sebastian doesn't speak. He's autistic like you, but he just doesn't speak. He goes, why not? I said, I don't know, Ellis. I, I can't answer that question. And he's been in copious amount of years of therapy. And I was just like, it's just there's some people on the spectrum that sometimes the words don't come out. And it, it could, they could spend years and not speak. So you have to understand that no two people who are on the spectrum are alike. You have to understand that. He's like, okay, so if a person autistic like me, but they talk, could we be a little bit alike? I said, well, it depends. Like if you talk to them and you find out something you like or have in common, maybe. Okay, so if the person doesn't talk, that's more work for me that I have to figure out how to like um, talk to them. I said, yes. Um, a funny example, we were on a basketball court. There was this um, African-American um, child. He was um, deaf mute. And he was telling Ellis, oh, he goes, I want to play. I want to play basketball. I was like, okay. And Ellis was like, I understood because my uh, growing up, my um, cousin is deaf mute. So I told her sign language like at nine, ten years old. Oh, so okay. she was like, what, her 20s? But she had the functionings of like a 10, 11 year old. So she had that. You know, so that's, that's are, you teaching, are you teaching Ellis sign language too or, or not yet? I did. I did. Um, just uh, the basics especially depending on who he talks to. So let's um, switch gears. And you um, you were telling me off air that you found out you were you had ADHD when you were five years old. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask a little bit further, like how did it affect you in your parenting um, once you found out the diagnosis for, for Ellis? Oh boy. It was just like, oh man. Uh, it felt like uh, a mountain fell on top of me. Uh, when I was five, it explained a lot of why it was harder for me to focus, harder for me to um, be more. As I became a parent, it was just like, oh boy, I'm going to need help. I have to pay attention to what this little boy does. I, I can only give him so much space. And I really have to be invested in him. And I have to show my hyper attention to him. So that was, that's why it was, I became like a little consumed obsessive because there are versions, there are times that a person with ADHD can have like obsessions and hyper attention on certain things, especially if they really care about it. And um, when I wasn't working, I was on top of stuff. If he cried, lo cargaba. If he peed, I would change the pamper. If he did this, if he did whatever it is, and I was on top of it. And then um, when the diagnosis came, I was just like, oh. I felt, that's what I felt guilty because I was just like, okay, so you mean my ADHD, me as a child, could have contributed to my son coming up with autism? Like, well, you can blame yourself. There were some things that were similar. And I was just like, mm. I feel like a lot like, of things. I felt like I was, uh, for me, I felt guilty because I was like, oh man, like I didn't take care of myself and then I didn't take the vitamins like I needed to. I didn't like get myself under control. Mm -hmm. So when I found this, you know, that out as a person with ADHD, it was just like, it was a lot. It wasn't easy. Like, there were times I would just like wait for him to go to sleep and I would just cry a little. Because I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, this child has a condition that I don't understand and it's going to take me years to understand. And then I have my own like issues with things and try to balance and stuff like that. And there are times that I forget it. I, I look like a deranged lunatic sometimes. I'm not even going to lie. But some people just look at me like, so listen, I'm trying to reconcile, I'm trying to deal with life as is. So let you know, live and let die. Thank you so much. Out of my face.
Oh, I get a lot of So, yeah, um, not at all. And um, the whole, oh, my whole ADHD diagnosis started um, a little after my sister died. My sister was three years old when she died. I was seven. So um, I had parts of it there, lenient, especially because um, my grandmother was the one like used to stay with me a lot. So when I went to school, it was funny because it was like, okay, I would have to speak Spanish and I, I, I have to learn how to speak English. So for the first, I think, two, three months, I had to take speech therapy too because there was parts of words that I was just not understanding. I was just like, ¿qué? You want me to say ¿qué? ¿Tú quieres que diga ¿qué? No. And then I used to mispronounce the teacher's name. Her name was Blue Steen. I used to call her Blue Steen. It wasn't intentional. It was just, <laughs> I have a Dominican abuela, and that's the way, you know, she right. called you went. Did you go to school? Did you, did you go to school here in the Heights? Uh, I went to school first in kindergarten on uh, PS. So then I went to DR for like nine months for like a semester. That was an interesting, uh, it, it was an interesting interaction altogether. And um, it was funny, very, very funny because um, I did kindergarten. They wanted to put me in the second grade. I was like, what? I said, wait a minute, I just learned color shapes and numbers. What, what you mean? That, oh, let me add Read what? Read this sentence and tell me what's a subject, verb, and predicate. I think I lasted six, seven months, and then I was just like, okay, this, I got to get out of here. Oh, and funny thing is, um, there was a lot of Asian folks in the American school in DR, because I went to George Washington School in DR. And uh, it was really funny. I landed up kind of assimilating how they spoke. That I don't know if I did it correctly or if I was making a mockery of how they spoke. And I was like, yeah, no. My cousin went to that school, but she's way younger than us. So, um, oh, yeah. this was in the 80s, Cha Cha. So, you know how that is. <laughs> the 80s things that were a little like up in the air, kind of different and strange. Um, so I went, to, yeah, and then I went to Our Lady of Lords here on 143rd and um, Ashram. Then I went to Initiation and then I went to uh, Mother Cabrini High School. So, that's where I got my height education in terms of that. And it was funny <laughs> to go to Cabrini because Cabrini had like the worst, craziest rep. I was like, Shit, yeah, okay. Um, tell me a little bit about the work you do regarding raising awareness um, about autism via your TV show and the documentaries you've produced so far. Okay, so um, the first documentary was, uh, it started with the following. I was watching movies on Netflix about autism, but I didn't see anybody of color. I didn't see any Latinos, I didn't see any African Americans. And um, they were mostly like, like one of them was a uh, love autism. It was a gentleman through the BBC. So he kind of uh, injected like this whole like, I don't know, it, it was just the way he did it, I didn't like it. And I was like, you know what, I, I could do something better. And I'm a parent, and I think I could do something with love and care and consideration for the community. And I believe that's what we need at the time. And um, I started with that documentary in 2018. I released it onto the film festival circuit like around 2019, 2020. And um, there's that one. The fundraiser I'm doing is for the American Autism Association. So that's part of uh, raising awareness. And uh, the second documentary, which is called uh, Labels of Autism, is the one that I speak to six different families from six different states. But they have people, they have their family members in their like late teens or sometimes in their 20s and maybe a couple going into 30s. And uh, it's really interesting to ask them questions about, um, aside from autism, what other underlying conditions do you have? Like some of them said anxiety, depression. Some of them said um, a little bit of OCD. So it's a lot. And um, that's what I do. And for my TV show, I actually did an episode with Synergia, which is on 125th. 
So with them, I wanted to interview them for the longest, and I am trying to um, do some resources with them, like uh, respite or contact um, rehabilitation, and then also even a job coach. And um, currently, my son is uh, with Tri-County Care. So they're a care management system, and um, my mom takes care of my son as his current um you could say HHA maybe in that kind of branch. And she does respite for him and uh, she does community rehabilitation. But we kind of balance it out between my mother and myself in terms of that. Um, that's how I, I I feel like I do my little my little chip to my autism award in terms of doing all that. And um, it that's just great. came from being a mom and from being in it every day, no rest, 24-7, 365. And um, that's what was the biggest motivator. And I love it. I like what I do. I like that I always kind of breaking down misconceptions, assumptions. And I'm just like, oh, okay. And I've met other parents and I try to speak to other parents. And some parents are more reserved. Some parents have, you know, a little more care, a little more concern. And there's certain ways, you know, and things like that, but the common factor is that the, the child's autistic. So, and I'm like, listen, and it's great. I love meeting another um, parent on the spectrum that has a child on the spectrum. It's like, okay, what is your what is your child? Oh, and you say this. Does yours do that? No, oh, and you say it for that. My mine did that, but like six months ago. I feel it's like great. I love I feel it. Like it's, it's like great. it's like um, you know, when people used to play Yu Gi Oh and stuff that you had like the different abilities and stuff or 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 like rather like um wait wait no no i'm gonna take it back i'm not you view it was like remember x-men trading cards it's like what what's your what's your special ability and they can do this and does the does he or she do this oh my god you know it's like you know like and especially as a teacher because i get to see so many different facets of autism and it's just like they're so fascinating to me, and it just like warms my heart. Cause like honestly, as a special education teacher, yes, I do deal with different disabilities. But I feel like because I started um, working in District seventy five with kids that had autism um, in a six to one to one classroom, and mm -hmm. I've you know worked in different settings, I and because of you know with my son and the other kids that I know it's like I feel like I specialize in autism so it's like getting to know the kids and, and like seeing all the little nuances and little differences and and how they're like vary themselves and then like oh and then I love my favorite thing is like tapping into whatever it is that they're passionate about because oh, it's yeah. like it's like your brain explodes because like oh. you know they might not be able to do something just yet but then once you tap into that thing they're passionate about, it's like, what? Like, what are you? It's like, it's like you I, I'm always like life? so, my my oh. jaw is always on the floor. I'm like, amazing, you know? I had a I had a um I had a student that was nonverbal and um well limited verbal, very limited, and um he was Chinese and Dutch. And this little boy was not talking a lot when he got to me. And um, through the work with the speech teachers and me prompting him, we ended up finding out that he loves music. So he was able to sing, but he wasn't able to speak necessarily. Oh, wow. So by the time I left him, that I stopped teaching him when he was in first grade, he was singing all the time um, to the point that he loved it so much that he would put on performances for his family because um, he would actually go back to the Netherlands to visit his family. So he would like put on little performances that he would um, write himself. Sweet. How cute is that, right? And I'm just like, it's like, you know, once you tap into that little thing, it's like, I love, I love like talking to other moms of children with autism because it's like, it's like, oh my God, look, and, and this is similar and this is different. And, and even, even like after the diagnosis, like, what happens to your child not every like i love what you said earlier you meet one person with autism you met one person with autism there is no it's mm -hmm. like you know there might be some similarities 
but that doesn't mean that they're, everybody's experience is the same or that um, every, every comorbidity, right? Not everybody has underlying conditions that are similar. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to listen and to understand and to, you know, um, talk to people because at the end of the day, you know, it's just, you know, just different people. Just like you meet a woman that is Dominican, right? You. And you meet another woman that's Dominican, me. We have very different experiences, even though we are from the same culture. And I want to, this is something that I want to drive home to people that do not have people with autism in their life, right? Or with a disability, that everybody's experience is different. You can't lump everybody together and not everybody who is on the spectrum is like the good doctor or is, you know, you know, it's not that sexy yeah, autism. I'm, I'm sorry. The documentary, because you're going to see an image of that. And I had to put it unlisted on YouTube because I yeah. used two images from like there. And, you know, YouTube's very stringent about certain things. Like if you use a certain mm -hmm. song, it's going to be copyrighted and you can't monetize off of that. So I was like, you know, I'm just going to put it unlisted. And whoever wants to see it, just let me know. I'll, I'll send you the link and stuff like that. And uh, surprisingly, so yeah, like it's 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 not always the sexy autism, guys. It's not you know a Asperger's, a person that's just socially awkward and you know they're just quirky or whatever. Which you know, I'm not discounting that person's experience. Everybody's experience is different, but you know, there's different experiences, and and the, the, it's called a spectrum for a reason, right? There, there's people that are you know really verbal and high functioning, and are like honestly are socially awkward and just have a few quirks and there's people that are you know extremely autistic and they have more needs than other people so but just because they're like that doesn't mean that they're not intelligent and it doesn't mean that they don't deserve the same respect as a person that is verbal i just wanted to say that sorry go ahead no no but you're right and um that's another thing about it being a spectrum is difficult because they think just because you're verbal that you don't need the services and like, oh, nah, they'll be okay. It's like, no, you still do need to go to a shrink. You still do need certain therapies to, like, try to navigate this. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, like, fly by night. Just because the person can sp speak and express themselves doesn't mean that they won't have a meltdown in public. My, my least favorite thing, this is my pet peeve. Oh, he doesn't look autistic. What does oh, autistic oh, look oh, like? Oh, oh, oh my god! It's like it's like when somebody says to you, "Oh, you don't look Dominican." Do I have to look like a platano? You know, walking around with, with like you know, mm, 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 garrafon de agua en la cabeza, a, a, a thing of water in my head? No. Yes, yes. <laughs> there is no look. There is no look for autism. There is no look for autism. Sorry, sorry, guys. I'm a little triggered by that. It's so funny. It's <laughs> terrible. Because you should look at the light. Okay, so okay, I'll tell you a quick um, story. My son, uh -huh. one thing is with him, you have to repeat yourself because he has a short memory for um, certain things. So the constant redirecting, prodding, and prompting, he forgets. So there was this one kid. Everybody was throwing water down the slide. And then this kid, you know, was trying to go down the slide. And I was just like, you know, can I just throw water? Everybody's throwing water. No wappy, no wappy. The kid was like, whatever neurotypical is considered. I, I, I don't know. Point is, the kid got pissed off, punched all this in the stomach. The mother, like, did like a cheap version of trying to find me, per se. And then when I saw that, I said, excuse me, what the hell are you doing? He goes, oh, he was wetting me, and I told him not to wet me. He's autistic. What is wrong with you? He just got out of therapy. What kind of, and then the mother was like, oh, I couldn't find you. Where were you sitting? I was sitting over there. You didn't really make an effort to try to find out who's his mother. You just wanted your son to hit my son. So what am I supposed to do? Put a t-shirt on him that says, I'm autistic. Don't beat me up. Really? What kind of savage are you raising? Did you just call me a savage? I said, exactly. That's what it is, apparently. Mm -hmm. And then the no. kid was like, but he, I said, first of all, you don't talk to me like that. Take the bass out your voice. I am not your mother. 
and I am not one of the little people here on the um, the playground. Okay, you learn how to speak to adults. That's not how you speak to an adult. Like you're screaming at them. Okay, I'm not screaming at you. I'm just raising my voice, but I'm making sure that I'm assertive and direct. Learn if you know what that means. Look it up. And then um, there was oh like two God. teenage kids got behind. I would have lost it. They were like, I'm so sorry. And they're like, nah, you got to go. They were telling the family, you got to go. That's messed up. He's autistic like his mom is saying. And then like some teenage kids were like, are you okay? And then one girl was hugging Ellis. He's like, no, no. And he's crying. So, yeah, that, that's a... Uh, that's one thing. Where, that where, what park was this? Girl, I'm not even going to tell you because it's just like, mm. yeah. It was in the Bronx. Mm. It was by the two Go and the figure. five train near the Bronx Zoo. Go figure. I'm not going to say nothing else about the Bronx. Sorry to my listeners that are from the Bronx. But, nah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just like oh. it's just like, okay. But nah, nah, we're not and doing then, that. Um, another time, these kids were like really curing Ellis. They were, they were saying some other kid's name. And Ellis was like, that's not my name. Why are you calling me that? I don't know you. Oh, he looks like this kid from our school. <laughs> I'm like, well, he's not. Do you mind? Do you, do you mind stopping that? And then Ellis has the bad, the bad, um, hmm. I don't know how to say it in English. He has a bad habit. There bad habit. It came to me. <laughs> that um, he kind of uh, repeats a lot of stuff that seems like ridicule. Like if he hears it on YouTube, he thinks it's cool to say it. And I'm just like, oh, And this girl, I was dying. She was like, oh my God, you're being a bully. You're kidding me, right? So he's autistic. What do you mean he's being a bully? No, because he keeps on saying, ha ha, you're never going to get me. You're, you're, you're too slow. You're too this. I said, you know he was watching something before he got here. And then her little 15-year-old brother, who I was taller than, was on some, what's going on? Yeah, what is going on? I'm his mother. What's going on? Oh, no, she's saying he's a bully. He's not a bully. He has special needs. He's just verbalizing himself. What's the problem? You know what kills me is nowadays people want to throw that bullying word around all the time. Oh, yeah. People need to look up the definition of bullying. And one time occurrence of something happening is not bullying. Bullying is a persistent um, targeting of a person. And it can be verbal. It could be um, virtual. It can be in person. Um, but it's persistent. It's not a one-time thing. So we can't throw away the word around the word bullying just willy-nilly because at the end of the day, that is not bullying. Yeah, the yeah, person could be being mean. The person could be acting like a jerk. The person could be doing whatever it is, but that's not bullying. It's very different. And it's, you know, we need to be a little bit more clear. And I get it. Um, a lot of, you know, we're working with millennials. Millennials don't take a lot of stuff. But, um, yeah, bullying is not that. So, yeah, definitely not. So, um, okay. So, I'm going to get a little personal. You ready? I'm going to do my So, now that you are divorced, have you started dating again or yet? Um, or would you like to defer? <laughs> It's not really dating. Um, has dating as an autism mom been easy? Nope. I did have a, a situation ship. It wasn't a relationship. A situation ship. And um, it lasted about almost two years. Of course, uh, he was doing a balancing act with me and somebody else, and I was just like, okay, you can drop me, it's fine. No shit, no, no skin off of mine. I know where I stand, I know what I need, and uh, this is not it, compadre, te jodite. <laughs> this is not it, sir. Sorry, you're screwed. And uh, that was 2018. And then I, I had my fun, you know. 
make sure you know that I'm still sexy. Um, dating wise, I haven't dated anybody in the last like two years. So it's been by nice. choice or is just kind of you've been busy with projects and things like that. Well, between offering documentaries, starting a television show, and then um, I even did stand up comedy, which is fun. Um, I did two open mics at the um, Gemma. I'm doing this fundraiser, trying to finish up the documentary, uh, the long version of it. And uh, yeah, it's been busy. I've kept myself busy on purpose. So it's gotten to the point that I feel like I'm handicapped in terms of, uh, or I've hindered myself, how to socialize if it's not for something beneficial. Like if it's not for a project, I'm kind of like, <laughs> oh, you think I'm cute? <laughs> really? Oh, the other day, somebody, I was on I was on Instagram Live, and all of a sudden this guy goes, oh my God, you have a great smile. Uh, huh? Like I dead ass froze. I was like, um, um, I was talking about my fundraiser. <laughs> I felt like I was going through puberty on Instagram because he was like, I was like, yo, um, get an eagle. Uh, let's see. I, um, I'm going to disconnect. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Bye. I always do like, when I get uncomfortable, I do the finger guns. I'm like, thanks. Like, Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> right back at you, bro. <laughs> Thank you. And then I click on the photo. I'm like, ooh. Yeah, it's okay. I'm going to say something really like, uh, this is really bad to say, but. Yo tengo dos manos y puedo, y puedo ir para la tienda a comprar juguetes. <laughs> English translation. Uh, I got two hands and I know where to speak for. <laughs> oh my gosh, okay. Worst case scenario, if anything does happen. Um, okay, so open? wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Are you open to dating? I don't know. I really don't know. It's funny. That's an honest answer. I, I don't know. I am. I don't think I am. I, I'm open to having a good time. Like, I don't mind. I've, I have, you know, I have friends that I could go out with and hang out with, knowing that nothing can happen. Like, we're super platonic friends. I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't care what's underneath the clothes. You're a nice person. You've never disrespected me. I'm okay with you. And then there's people that are just like, you know, like if I had to date somebody, I was just like, uh, so what do you do? What don't I do? Hmm. I don't do what you think I'm going to do after this date is over. Like this one guy, he, um, I tried Facebook dating. ¿Para qué fue eso? Para, por Dios, ¿para qué fue eso? I kept on meeting people with such weird, like, oh, I have five kids, and of course, two of them are autistic, and I, but um, we're divorced, but I moved back into the house to help her with the kids. Oh, red flag. That's called parenting to the umpteenth, I'm guessing. I, what? You have five kids with her? Like, what? Okay. Five? You had intention to have a foundation, real estate, the house, the mortgage, and perro gato. You had you had investment there. Like, come on, bro. And all of a sudden, it doesn't working for you after how many years? You should have realized after kid number two, not after kid number five. Like, oh, espérate, you know, you're different from what when we began. When did you notice after kid number two, after kid number three? Or did you wait till number five exactly? Exactly. So like somebody also. that has no accountability. Exactly. Or doesn't check in with themselves. Yeah. And then another guy was oh, like, man. oh, uh, her and I lost the love, but we're here, you know, I, I we have two kids together, so we're good co-parents, but I, I, I don't look at her that way. We're, I'm staying in the same house as she is. Si, como no. That means you're full of care. That's what I mean. Oh my goodness. No, no, right. it gets better. So, it gets better. Wait, wait, 
wait, wait, wait, wait. Okay. I'm just like, ugh. So, I don't know. No sé. I said, period. That's it. I cannot anymore. <laughs> I just said, said, period. No sé. Si me pasa, me pasa. Si no me paso, amén. That's it. I just, like, I don't know. I can I'm waiting that. for that. I don't, I'm tired of the virtual interactions in terms of, like, I, I don't like getting hit on online. I'm sorry. I, I don't. Even, and in person, it's just like, okay. Do you still get cackled? No. No? Really? Oh my god. Yo siempre ando con la cara como una perra. <laughs> I've always got, I always got a face. I got the attitude face. I'm like, don't try me. No, see, with me, um, <laughs> well, I've talked to many reasons. Because I'm tall. But I, I don't, I'm not smiling. I just have the and then when, when I talk, they're like, oh, you have a nice voice. Like one guy was really funny. He was drunk and I was trying to buy a sandwich from the deli. And he's like, damn, ma. Oh, my God. I had to like come into the store to see you in person, ma. Your ass is amazing. I'm wearing black pants. Like, really, bro? And they're like, Bloho, what are you talking about that I have an amazing ass? Entonces tenía su, su chatica de, de, de ron. Half of it was gone. It was here. I was like, yeah, you, you're not all there. I appreciate the love, but you're not all there. All right. Um, so you said that before you fell into kind of a, a depression because you weren't really taking care of yourself. So I want to know now what the self-care looked like for you. <laughs> what I go through. Really? When I go do laundry, that's self care. What? Yeah, like um, I do my hair ever so often, like maybe once every couple months because sometimes I'm either working overtime or um, or just doing stuff. Because sometimes I even have to rush to poor hair stylist. I feel bad. I feel like, listen, I can't sit here for three hours. I'm sorry. Um, I know I have long hair, but I need you to blow dry. I got to go pick up my son. I have to be there before at 2.20. Mama. But it's 10.30 in the morning. Mama, let's go. <laughs> I need to be out of here. I got to have lunch and I got to walk out. I, I haven't had a manicure since 2020. I haven't done a pedicure in a while. I haven't had a massage. Oh, I did have, what did I do? I did acupuncture. The acupuncture, I did not like the way they did it because of the adverse reaction I had. <laughs> so, All right. Uh, um, yeah, Girl, so we need to, there. we need to, I need to school you mm -hmm. and get you, get you all the way together with the self-care aspect. I know. Because you I, cannot I, continue to pour from an empty cup or half empty or a quarter empty. No, oh, yeah. No, when you told me that you were doing yoga, I was like, damn. I haven't done yoga in like 12 years. I'm not saying do all the self care things at the same time. To pick one thing and do that consistently and then add to that, you know, start a routine for yourself. Yeah. It's important. Oh, also, my problem is, it's just that it's part of my um, ADHD, it's the impulse spending. Mm -hmm. Like, I could do the self-care. It's just, I'm like, oh my God, and I start like, the hamster wheel starts turning. And then the guilt comes after the spending. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, do I have, do I have enough for next week? And will I have this, will I have that? So. I gotta get into yeah, that. Yeah, we need to start working on that with you. We need to work on that yeah. with you. Yes, yes. I, I need even it. if it's just painting your own nails. Even you don't have to spend money. Even if it's just doing it for yourself. This is true. Like I it's important. I had let's see, just any eyebrows. I hadn't done my eyebrows since December, and I did my eyebrows, and I did a little bit of my face. Because the thing is, usually for me. 
If I do my hair, I like to do my eyebrows, I do my face, I like to do my nails, which Saturday, I got to look all the way like profesh. So I have to look nice for Saturday. So that's kind of a big motivator. Like, Dance it, I still know. Ponte, it's weird and um after like my divorce um my separation trips um i'm still working on the divorce it, it's expensive and time consuming um I, there was a i think that's why i kind of fell into like i don't yo cocinaba más when i when i was you know in the house with him I used to like, you know, pick up the clothes and make sure everything was me. I feel la cama, arreglaba esto, arreglaba el otro. And then like, once he left, I just felt kind of like, okay, I don't have to impress anybody anymore. I just have to make sure that I'm alive and this lovely little child with brown eyes who looks, who has my 23 jeans and his 23 jeans is alive, breathing and screaming. After that, I'm okay. <laughs> and then once I um I do that, then I, I felt okay. But um yeah, there's when I, when I'm with somebody or dating or liking somebody, oh girl, I make efforts. Do my, do my, do my, but you gotta do it for yourself, not for nobody else. I know, but it's just been like I'm okay with, as long as I shower. And I brush my teeth, and I, my hair is okay. Oh my gosh! And I don't have wrinkles happening. I'm okay. Oh I know. I just like look at me like, no, that's a valor, no, no, no. No, yeah, like. The I mean the thing is like you know we do go through it and and I understand you know. But, you know, like, going to therapy helps a lot, too, you know, to help you get in the mindset of, like, loving yourself first, mm -hmm. you know, before you start dating. Because, you know, once you once you start loving yourself for, first and, like, showing you that you love you, it's going to be easier to attract somebody that's going to treat you the way you deserve to be treated. What do you think about that? I'm working on that. I'm working on that. I've been to therapy. I had to um, take a break from therapy because uh, one social worker asked me very rudely, what are you here for, really? I'm Listen, you can dump your therapist. You can always dump your therapist. Like, if you don't oh, like yeah, the person, you can find another one. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, um, and with that, comadre, um, I want to end the episode how I usually end the episode, and it's follow me at comadre on the pod and follow Eudi on IG at... Roman um, Epic Productions, right? Yes, the Roman Epic Productions. The Roman Epic Productions. You can see all my work and also my episodes for my TV show. And I'm also on YouTube. So the Roman Epic um, Productions, all one word. You see my lovely face, though. <laughs> <laughs> and also, please, support, support. We have to support our creators in our communities. Mm-hmm. There are great people doing fantastic things. Never forget that. You always just have to look and see. Okay? There could be someone right. walking away from you on the street, and you don't know if that person is doing something so great. And if you just take time to listen to a podcast, to watch a YouTube video, or to even watch them on public access television, you'll be supporting them that way. Hell, even reposting whatever they post, even doing mm -hmm. something as simple as that. It doesn't cost a thing to do that. And you, you'll never know what kind of people you will engage with or come come across. I agree with that. And um, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to send me a comadregram via email at comadreando at esctheNetwork.com or slide up into my DMs. Uh, thank you for spending time with your comadres. And I want to say bye. Take care, Adios. everybody. Bye. <laughs> Take care. We have